There are those who cut and those who edit. Today, we meet the latter. Tate Webb on this edition of Viewfinder. Tate Webb is one of the finest editors I have ever had the pleasure of working with. His technical skill and his creative eye makes him a master storyteller. We are pleased to have him on this edition of Viewfinder. Welcome to Viewfinder, Tate. Thanks, so. All right, man. Now, we go way back to, like, to the 90s. Right, <laughs> right. Now, we're going to get into all of that, how we got a chance to work together and everything, but I, I want to go down the, um, the road and understand the story of Tate. Okay. So where were you born? I uh, was born in a hospital that was in Marymount, Ohio at the time. You were born in Marymount? Yeah. Excellent. Uh, and uh, I grew up out in Claremont County. Mm. Um, went to school out in Claremont Northeastern High School. And, wow. Uh, grew up kind of, you know, out there in that, that kind of rural farming community. Right, right. And uh, from there went off to college at a school called Asbury. Uh, Where's Asbury? Uh, it's outside Lexington, Kentucky. It's a okay. small town called Wilmore. Okay. Um, and so what did you study in college? I, st I studied, it was a, a BA in broadcast communications. Now, what made you want to get into broadcast communications? Uh, you know, I think just when I was really little, I was really into my tape recorder, <laughs> taping things off the radio. <laughs> and, uh, you know, so that was just kind of a natural progression. Right, of, right. Know, interfacing with electronics and right. creating things that I could, like, view over and over or listen to over and over. And so you're kind of like Spielberg. With, share with friends. Spielberg liked to tape his train crashes so he could watch them over and over again. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> so probably, was, probably something a little bit like that. Excellent, excellent. Now, you started off being fascinated with audio mm -hmm. and tape recording. What made you move to the moving image? Well, you know, in college, when you get exposed to people telling stories with moving images, mm -hmm. um, you know, that's intoxicating, yeah. or I, I found it to be intoxicating. Mm -hmm. and, and I found it to be something that I was so captivated with, I mm. just pulled into it and mm. became, you know, part of, part of the rhythm of my life. Mm. Um, you know, it wasn't like something I thought was kind of cool or clever or right. neat or techy, right. um, but it was, it, it kind of like registered with something deep in me that I didn't understand. Oh, that's wonderful. That's wonderful. You're very fortunate when you find that when you're young. Yeah. Something that resonates with you so deeply. Right, it was, a, it was definitely accidental. Wow. In, in, in a big way. Right. Well, I don't, I don't know. I think your steps were ordered. <laughs> yeah, true, true, true. Now, why editing? Because you were exposed to the whole filmmaking process, directing, and you started out with a fascination for audio and what have you. Why editing? You know, I think that this idea of, of, of getting into a quiet place normally mm. with all of this storytelling telling material mm -hmm. and being able to work this in so many different ways mm -hmm. um, and, and stop time to mm -hmm. kind of like mm -hmm. really see if this is really working or not. Mm -hmm. um, you know, like what you're doing with live television is mm -hmm. just so quick and mm -hmm. so precise mm -hmm. and just, you know, it's mm -hmm. got to work right then. Right. You know, in, in the edit room, mm -hmm. you can you can really kind of like slow things way down mm -hmm. and really look deep within what you're working on. Look mm -hmm. at the expressions of the characters. Mm -hmm. uh, look at the performance of the characters. Mm -hmm. um, you know, because if you don't believe it, mm -hmm. how can you expect somebody else to believe it? How, how do you think that, you know, putting a sequence together of just somebody going through some type of a, of, of a procedure, mm -hmm. um, you know, technically, yes, you've told a story, right. but, you know, is it a compelling story? Exactly. Um, are you, like, engaging people? So, that, you know, yes. that's the best part about editing is that you really can get things on the operating table and look deep, you know, within the story that you have in front of you. So you remind me of what a great acting teacher told me once after I'd done this monologue. He says, you know what, Alfonso, you dazzle me, but you don't move me. Hmm. You know, mm. and we see a lot of editing that dazzles, quick cuts, pop, 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 and yeah. that might be the um, the objective of the particular piece. Mm -hmm. But it seems like what you want to do as a storyteller is you want to get in there with the material and you want to create something that moves people. Yeah, and and I think for me, my journey it kind of comes with age. Like I'm mm -hmm. in my mid 40s now, mm -hmm. and everything I have a different perspective on. Mm -hmm. 
um, you know, and, and there's a lot more meaning in everything I do. Right. You know, I want to be more intentional with everything I do right. because I right. realize how, how many repercussions hmm. everything that we do has on yes. the world and community yes. around us. Yes. Um, and especially when you're tasked with being a storyteller, yes. um, you know, you're putting a story into motion that will exist long mm. past the point where you're not around anymore. Right. Exactly. Um, and, uh, you know, this idea of being able to put life and light mm -hmm. into the world through a mm. story life that, and light. that goes on rather than say, like, we would go the opposite of that, mm -hmm. like death and darkness. Right. You know, there are a lot of people who want to tell stories right. that are about death and darkness. Right. Um, you know, I think that these stories about life and light mm -hmm. or finding them even in the darkest kind of a story mm -hmm. um, are, have so much power and uh, the truth that's in all of us mm -hmm. that we see it. And, mm -hmm. we, and we feel that truth, you mm -hmm. know, and, and, it, and it changes us. Yes. No, you're absolutely right. No, you're absolutely right. Um, I talked earlier about how you and I work together. So I, I first met you as an editor when you were at Lightborn. Yes. So um, was Lightborn your first Cincinnati gig, full-time Cincinnati gig? Uh, when I had moved to Cincinnati. Okay, uh, you were, was, where were you before? Um, my first job out of college, I was working down in Charlotte, North Carolina. It was mm. a place called Creative Post and Transfer. Were you an editor? Um, I was assistant editor, mm. and the cool thing about that was it was an experiment in Charlotte where right. this company decided to recruit editors and colorists and graphic people from all over the country to try to build this super edit post facility. Wow. Um, and so these people really invested. What year was this? Uh, this would have been 91, 1991. Wow, 1991. And uh, so these people really invested mm -hmm. in me. Like I had this great opportunity mm -hmm. where these people from all over the country were brought here because they were the best at what they did. In Florida? Um, no, North uh, this Carolina. This was in North Carolina. Yes, North Carolina, um, yes. They ended up being purchased by ESPN because wow. it did so well. Wow. Um, and then they and they did move it to Florida. Right. But, but uh, my wife was starting grad school in Birmingham, Alabama. Right. So I moved to Birmingham and, and found a great post house there called. So so you went from North Carolina, right? Yes. To Birmingham. To Birmingham. And what and what brought you back to Cincinnati? Uh, you know, it's one of those things where uh, everything in your life just kind of aligns, and you know mm -hmm. the right thing to do. Mm -hmm. Hmm. Um, and my wife, who was studying to be in physical therapy, mm -hmm. a master's in physical therapy, mm -hmm. um, found a job up at Children's. Mm. Um, and we were like, this is, our story continues. This is another part of our story, and this is where we're going next. Well, let's, let's see a little bit of your storytelling ability. All right, great. As an editor right sure, now. Sure, great. And then we'll come back, and we'll, we'll continue to discuss. Okay, awesome. Set up this first clip for uh, us. This first clip is the first two minutes of a short documentary that made it into Sundance uh, in 2010. Where was uh, it shot? It was uh, shot in Florida right. by a director named Vance Malone, mm -hmm. and uh, Vance lives out in Santa Monica, right. and I had worked with him uh, on some advertising type of projects, right. and, and we had a real connection as far as how we both like to tell stories. Excellent. So he let me tell this story. I edited wow. it here at my home in my basement <laughs> in a cul-de-sac vinyl clad house. Um, I love it. And uh, we submitted it to Sundance, and right. it was an official selection at Sundance. So that's oh. just the first two minutes of Poodle Trainer. Brother, that, that's amazing, because Sundance is tough yeah, it was good. to get into. And good. this is called Poodle Trainer. Yep, the Poodle Trainer. Poodle, the Poodle Trainer, it's the first two minutes of the film. Yes, sir. And you edited it. Yes. All right, let's check it out. All right. I was born from childhood, that I would dress myself. Скажи, я, я себя не видела вообще ни в чем больше. Я знала, что он работает в цирке. Что я увлеченный человек, и я живу вот с цирком, я вся в работе. А у меня от моей карьеры просто невозможно. Здесь вот, наверное, как-то вот как с детства я замкнутый человек была, и как бы вот живешь как бы в другом мире. И, то есть какой-то замкнутый мир, другая жизнь. Здесь нет такого жестокого мира, допустим, как где-то. И в 9 лет мне разрешили наконец-таки приобрести породистую собаку. Я не научила ее в 
туалет ходить на улицу, и мама поэтому продала мою собаку. У меня была такая трагедия, которую я не могу простить ей по сей день. То есть, когда я вспоминаю об этой собаке, я до сих пор плачу. То есть, это была самая лучшая собака в моей жизни. Да это со мной идет, проходит годы, но легче не становится. Fantastic, man. Fantastic. What, what a wonderful portraiture. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and an amazing documentary. Yeah. And this was in Sundance. Yeah. And, and you got to cut it, and you cut it in the basement of your home. Right, right here, northern Kentucky. <laughs> um, and the, the cool thing was the director, Vance Malone, mm -hmm. who you can tell is amazing yes. as a director. Yes. Um, he really just sent me a hard drive mm -hmm. full of interview footage and all this B roll footage, and, and the original uh, idea was. No script? No script. Wow. Uh, and the original idea was we are not sure if we've really got a story here. Wow. See if you can find a story. See, I, see, I love editors like that. So, yeah, I really do. It was, because there's some editors that unless you send them script notes and yeah. scripts and everything else, they just freak yeah. and get upset yeah. and most, everything yeah, else. Most of the work I do, I usually start with no script notes. Wow. Um, I usually like to start with no material except the material itself. Wow. Uh, and then I'll So you go, go through and you screen all that material yeah. yourself? Yeah, I do. And, and it was all in Russian in this particular wow. thing. So I, I really, I had my wife <laughs> record the entire script right. in her voice. Right. I edited the entire film with my wife's voiceover wow. with all this stuff just kind of put into place. And then when I was finished with the cut, it actually went out to LA and translators came in and made sure that what I was trying to tell of the story, they actually found the clips of her saying those things. Wow. So in my original cut, it, my wife was telling the story and right. she may have been talking about like an itch that she had on the back of her right. head or something right. like that. Right. I didn't know because it was Russian. <laughs> I don't speak Russian. Right, right. <laughs> So, so how many hours of footage did you have to go through? Um, I think in this there wasn't that much. It was probably about five to six hours okay. of footage. Right. And how long did the end cut end up being? Uh, it's, uh, I think it's around seven minutes. So oh, it's, it's a it's, seven it's minute a short, short. It's okay. a short documentary. Yeah, but, that, but that, that's still a big ratio, five hours for seven minutes. Yeah. So you went through five hours worth of footage, and as you're watching it, what's going through your mind? Are you, are uh, you letting the story emerge to uh, you? Or? I knew immediately as I was going through the stuff, I could hardly stay in my chair because mm. there was just so much magic there. Mm -hmm. The imagery, the story, it mm -hmm. was just all there, and I knew that all I had to do was kind of get out of the way mm -hmm. and let the, toy, the story tell itself. Wow. Um, and it was one of those things like every 15, 20 minutes, I would have to get up and pace around the basement mm. just because I was so excited. Mm -hmm. Like there was something more than me yes. there yes. telling this story. Yes. Her yes. story was something more than her. Yes. Um, and I was just kind of surrendered over to that experience. Mm. Um, Amazing. Know, yeah. So. How do you go about going through all that footage and letting a story, I mean, because you have to bring your own humanity right. and your own perspective to yeah, it. Yeah. So the director chose you, so he must have seen something in your character that he thought um, could find the story and the humanity in this. Because when I look at that, it's the humanity that jumps out at me, the fact yeah. that she still misses her dog, mm -hmm. that she doesn't forgive her mother to this day because mm -hmm. she gave the dog away mm -hmm. when she was a little girl. Yeah. The way those dogs and her relate to each other, it's almost human-like the way they, you know. It is, it is. I, I think for me, like I've always skewed way towards more of an introvert, you know, mm. I'm not an extrovert. I'm not right. like, hey, it's Tate in the right. room. <laughs> right, um, right. So I'm not really known for being a big conversationalist. Right, right. Um, but the way I pick up on the world around me, being more of an introvert, mm -hmm. is basically on body language and facial cues. Mm -hmm. Like I really want to know what somebody thinks or feels mm. based by the reactions they're giving me just with their bodies and mm -hmm. faces. Mm -hmm. um, it's how I relate with my clients when I'm in a room with a client editing. Mm -hmm. There doesn't need to be a lot of dialogue between us going on because right. they're seeing everything that's happening on right. the screen right. and I can see the delight in their eyes or I can see the concern in their eyes. So this this whole thing of kind of growing up and just kind of watching facial cues to mm -hmm. understand what people were thinking or mm -hmm. feeling um, was a great training ground that, for me as an editor. Well, but do you know what that um what that gives you, enormous emotional intelligence. 
because you know there's all different kinds of intelligence uh -huh. and a lot of people uh, don't really understand emotional intelligence but you have tremendous emotional intelligence and I think that's what serves you well well wow, that's good that's, that's nice that's nice well let's set up your next clip what's the next clip? all right uh, there are some filmmakers in Cincinnati mm -hmm. uh, rebel pilgrim yes it's uh, Joe Brad and Isaac mm -hmm. these guys are hot right oh yeah now. And They're making noise. I have a feeling that they will probably put more feature films out of this city Excellent. than anybody that I know. I'm Excellent. sure there's others that I don't know. Right. But they are, they've, they've got one that's been released September 9th. Mm. They're in production on another feature next month. Excellent. Um, and uh, I've been over to the office and they have a big whiteboard that mm. has at least a half a dozen of features that are all in development, being written, uh, getting funded. So they're here in Cincinnati mm. in the business Excellent. of... Uh, of, of talking to the world. And this is the trailer for the next film? I, I cut the trailer for the film. Right. I did not edit the film, but I did right. cut, the, cut trailer the trailer for him. Right. And I color graded the trailer and I color graded the entire film for him. Uh, so I served in, in that aspect. Well, we'll get into all of that after right. we see the trailer. Sure. Fantastic. And th what's the trailer? A for? Strange Brand of Happy. A Strange Brand of Happy. Yeah. All right, excellent. Come on, one more. You can do this. This follow your dreams thing, it's a fairy tale. Try. Just try. Show up and be there. Do I know you? What? How do you know my name? You told me. He kind of looks like a sickly Ray Romano. Yeah. Would you date him? I should walk you home. We could fall asleep watching a movie. I actually want to show you a picture of uh, our evening that we had last night. This guy is this close, OK? This close from having an overnight pajama party with your girl. So you're going to let William dazzle your girlfriend while you sit at home? Ben said you're feeling a little depressed. What are you doing telling people I'm depressed? Come on, man, don't say that, especially to crazy people. God doesn't shut a door without opening a window. It's a fine, fine life. It's a fine Whatever he tells you is a lie. What? Where, where are you going? You gotta retaliate. You know, an eye for an eye. You might want to uh, destroy that like in a permanent kind of way, buddy. Your smiles are simply signs of how sacred your life actually is. He made you, and he was happy. You make the Lord happy. Come into this. Did you buy this stuff? What? That you make God happy. Yeah. Oh, I'm sold. I'm there. Excellent work, man. You cut the trailer. Yes. Now, yes. Let's talk about that because I'm one of those people who love trailers. Yeah, me too. I love trailers. So let's talk about you watch the whole film. Yeah. Uh, you talk with the filmmakers. Mm -hmm. Did they give you some specific points that they thought would be strong in terms of marketing? Because a trailer is a commercial for a right, film. Right, right. Or did they kind of leave you alone and say, Tate, find your way? How, how did the, that process uh, The marketing go? advice that they got was that filmmakers generally shouldn't cut their own trailers right. because they're so close to the project. Right. So they really just gave me the film, mm -hmm. and uh, what I did is broke the film up into 10-minute chunks so mm. that they were more manageable. Mm -hmm. And then I just started kind of like pulling these elements together that, mm -hmm. that could you know, tease the film mm -hmm. but not give away the film, mm -hmm. and also set up things during the film that you, you feel like, wow, the trailer totally kind of misled me a little bit. It's so right. much funnier in the film. Right. So, it, it really was a lot of freedom, mm -hmm. um, and so I would do cuts and then share them with the guys, and uh, you know they would have like an emotional reaction, mm -hmm. um, and, and that's always mm -hmm. good because that collaborating exactly. is exactly. always good, and that can kind of yes. shape things as yes. we go. Yes. Uh, but it but it really was um, you know me being allowed to be a storyteller with this trailer. Um, that's fantastic. And it was you know a joy to do. Well, we look at your career, how you started out in North Carolina and then to Birmingham, mm -hmm. then you came back here mm -hmm. because of your lovely wife, and yeah. this is where your family blossomed and you worked at um, Lightborn, 
then PPS, right? Mm -hmm. And then you were part of that big rock and roll movement that rose up one day and Red Echo was Red born. Red Echo Post. Yeah, great. Right. And like you were there for? 12 years. 12 years. Yeah. And now you're on a different path. Yes. What's, what's the new, because I mean, you've worked for all the major post houses. I mean, there's only one other major post house that I can think of. And that'd be like bark, barking fish, uh -huh. you know. But Maybe I, I should put an application in. <laughs> <laughs> Terry, call me. No. <laughs> but I mean, you work for the the names. Those are the the big post houses in the city. Yeah. And now you you you've left Red Echo. Yes. And what what path are you on now? Uh, you know, leaving Red Echo was extremely difficult. Yeah, Those I are my imagine. closest friends yes. on the planet. Yes. Um, that's a family yes. there. Um, what happened to me is like this crazy journey. Um, I met this guy, um, his name's John Herman. He mm -hmm. works over at this uh, cool shop called Epipio, mm -hmm. and they're storytellers. Mm -hmm. And um, I got into like this- Storytellers on what medium? Um, um, web. In web, okay. On the yeah. web, yeah. So you the media storytellers, yeah. You should talk right. to these guys. These, okay. are, these, are, these guys are big time. They're right. all over the country right. doing real high profile right. stuff. Right, right. Um, but um, I m met this guy, mm -hmm. and I was in this like little small group um, and I had never known him before. Mm -hmm. It was like a Bible study mm -hmm. type of thing. Okay. And uh, there's this whole uh, like st uh, structure of this thing called a story formed life mm -hmm. where um, you really look at the fact that there's a gigantic story going on. Just, you know, mm -hmm. history now tells us there's a big story. Mm -hmm. When we look at ancient history, there's a big mm -hmm. giant story. When you mm -hmm. look at like the, the Torah of the Jewish custom, mm -hmm. there's a story in the mm -hmm. like, old, uh, New Testament, early Christianity, there's mm -hmm. a big story. But there's this giant story that's taking place. Mm -hmm. Um, and all of us are a story that's happening in the middle of all of this. We all have our story. Yes. And uh, this this uh, this cat, uh, John says, "How can you tell a more compelling story with your life?" And uh, and that just like grabbed a hold of me and just like grew, grew, grew. Mm -hmm. um, I realized that I am telling a story with my life in a way, and I want to tell a more compelling story with my life. And, and uh, the more that I thought about that and the more my wife thought about that, we knew that I had to kind of leave this traditional work structure mm -hmm. uh, that I was in and make my available, myself available to tell all these stories that I'd never have a chance to tell because they're stories that don't have budgets, right. I, bu budgets that are associated right. with them. They're, there's, you know, for all different reasons. Usually, I'm so exhausted and fatigued from all the. But it's a all, good exhaustion. All, yeah, but from all the work that I do professionally, yeah. when these great jobs come so, along, right. I have to say, you know, you I can't. am just whipped. Well, let, let's see some of the fruits of your labor one more time, and I okay. want to get into that. All right, cool. More because that's fascinating. Right. Uh, uh, what's this final clip? Uh, Folgers. Yes. Uh, did this nationwide jingle contest. Mm -hmm. People submitted their versions of a Folgers jingle. Mm -hmm. Folgers picked 10 people. Wow. But they they went further than that. They hired um, a, a director, mm -hmm. um, Charlie Gray, mm -hmm. and uh, he went around the country to all these people and shot many documentaries. Wow. Uh, he shot almost five hours of interview of every person. And you had to edit it down to what? A minute 50. Wow. And, and, uh, and about three hours of B-roll of every person. So wow. what you're going to see here is a, a minute 50 little documentary portrait of one of the jingle finalists right um, and then there's nine other ones online wow. that can be found if you go to folders.com and look at the jingle contest you can Absolutely. see the other other nine I can't wait let's but, check it out we got this one life right we wake up it's our life and I think everybody should do what they love to do my name is Enoch Kim I'm from Chicago Illinois Morning to me is a new opportunity to find new things that make me feel alive, to make music that I'm excited about, that my friends are excited about. In the jingle, I played the banjo. Jake, he sang, he plays the guitar. Kobe, he's the guy who played the kick drum. Rachel, she played the bass. We're all friends. A big thing with working with my friends on music is that they inspire me. They do things that I would have never dreamed of doing by myself. Just the way they make sounds, the way they play the drums, the way they write melody, the way that they sing. 
It's just so drastically different from the way I view music, and I just love it. I love being creative, whether it be like being creative with entertaining an audience or like writing a song in a creative way. There's like a moment that just hits me. It's like, wow, that's awesome. That's why I create. If I'm happy, then I am able to cause other people to experience that feeling in me. Life's not the same without music, man. Man, that is fantastic. And well, who is the agency? Uh, Possible, which is here in Cincinnati. Yeah. And uh, Nick Schultz was the creative director yes. on it. And uh, he really worked over a year with Folgers to get them to take a risk and tell an intimate story like this. All right. Um, it's really, it's great. Oh, the, the, it's a great hey, story. Nick, Nick over with Possible, holla at your boy. <laughs> I'm a director too. I got 22 <laughs> Emmys, I got four Eddies, holla at your boy. Everybody with Possible, so I can work with Tate. Holla at your boy. So Tate, yeah. What do you want people to most understand, especially about this new journey that you're going uh, on? You know, I, I basically walked away from a traditional lifestyle. Mm -hmm. uh, we're kind of like, you know, uninsured, health insured as a mm -hmm. family right now because we're kind of between this journey. Mm -hmm. um, really, my calling right now is to pull myself out and to make myself available to tell a bunch of stories that I could never tell before. So I'm Fantastic. looking for people who want to tell compelling stories. And um, how, uh, how can they get in contact with you? Uh, my website is tate.io. That's it. Perfect. And the web, my email address is tate at tate.io. Um, man, I could talk to you all day, man. Cool, man. See how quickly the time goes? Yeah, but right out of the gate, the thing I really want to work on is uh, is human trafficking. That's a big deal in Ohio. Yes, yes, and you're going to do a documentary trying to, trying to find people that want to tell a, a compelling story because people don't realize what's going on. Well, it's it's modern-day slavery. It's terrible. I'm so glad you were on the show, man. Like Thanks, I said, man. we go way back and... It's a pleasure, man. Good conversation. Thanks, brother. All right. It's good to see you. Alfred Hitchcock said that movies are life with all of the boring parts cut out. Here's hoping you cut out whatever is stopping you from looking through your viewfinder. Cut. <laughs>